Hey North Coast, I'm Tom. My wife Kayla and I are running our inaugural State Youth Games team for 2021. State Youth Games is a fun field sports weekend for 16 to 30 year olds held in Bunbury from the 4th to the 7th of June. Churches from all over WA send teams to participate in sports from fishing and UNO to netball and ultimate frisbee and everything in between. It's a great opportunity to hang out with like-minded young adults, glorify our God, meet other Christians and have some fun while we're at it. So head to the North Coast website, check out the sign up link or see the promo that's around the church. To make this weekend work, we need heaps of volunteers from positions from food preparation and catering to umpiring and scoring. If you think that you can help serve us, then let us know because there's a role for you. We ask if you to prayerfully consider coming to help serve the community of the North Coast Young Adults. Hi North Coast Church, it's Steve here. I uh, want to ask this question of you. Who do you think you are? What's your identity? That's a hot button topic today in our culture. Uh, who defines who you are? Uh, what markers are there that says this is who I am. What is my identity and where is it located? Everyone in our culture is on an identity search. And if you're not asking that question of yourself, people are saying, uh, what's going on in your life? Uh, have you not decided uh, what you're supposed to be? And the promise in our culture is you do you and it'll all sort out. If you do who you want to be and you, you go the way you want to go, things will work. The problem is that's not quite true. We're discovering in our context today, in our society, that the identity question is very hard to pin down. Is our identity in our work? Is it in our family? Uh, is our identity in our sex or our gender or even our success? And what happens when those things let you down? If you've forged all of your identity in who you decide you want to be and that fails, well, you've only got yourself to blame. Here's the good news. In the book of Ephesians, which we're going to be looking at together at North Coast in term two, we read that God has given us an identity in the Lord Jesus, and not just an identity, but a solid, sure identity in a culture of shifting sands. What we're going to discover is that God in Christ has given us an identity that will equip us for this age and for the age to come. We don't have to worry about forging an identity for ourselves that is bright and shiny to the rest of the world because in Christ, God looks at us and is pleased. And do you know what that does? It liberates us to truly be ourselves. It liberates us from the fear of other identities or of failure and prepares us for the good works that God has for us to do. It's gonna be an exciting time to explore identity in a world that's asking the question, who do you think you are? So come with us in term two and explore uh, these first three chapters of Ephesians around this question of identity. I know it can be life-changing for us and I'm looking forward for the team to be sharing it with you. G'day and welcome to North Coast Church Online. Great to be with you wherever you are, in your PJs, in your lounge room. Great joy to be with you today. If you're looking for North Coast kids, then... Uh, Check out the prompts on the website or uh, go to the directions in uh, the description below on the video. As we've heard, next week we're starting our new series of, in Ephesians called Identity, Who Do You Think You Are? So why not uh, start reading that book of Ephesians in preparation for uh, what God's going to say to us in the next few weeks. But for now, I'm excited to continue in being the bad guys, living for Jesus in a world that says you shouldn't. It's been a great series, hasn't it? And uh, one of the verses that's really stuck out for me is 1 Peter chapter 4. Have a look at it now. It says this, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you as though something strange was happening to you, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Do not be surprised. Being a Christian is not easy all the time. Trusting Jesus in a world that tells you not to is quite difficult. Living for Jesus when everyone around you isn't is not easy. But God has done great things 
for us in Jesus Christ. He's even died for our sins. And we rejoice now, don't we, in that, even though it's hard. And when he reveals his glory in all his fullness, we will rejoice even more. We have a great God who has done great things for us in Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Then we're going to sing. Then we're going to hear from him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can gather in our homes and hear your voice. We thank you that even though it is difficult to live for you in this world, we know we can rejoice in that difficulty because we know Jesus has come, has died for our sins, has risen from the dead, and you will reveal all your glory and we will rejoice in the end. So equip us now, speak to us, grow us and change us for the praise of your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey church, so good to be with you. Our God has indeed done great things and so let's worship him. Come let us worship our King Come let us bow at His feet He has done great things See what the Savior has done See how His love overcomes He has done great things He has done great things Break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. You've been faithful. Through every storm, you be faithful forevermore. You have done great things, and I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things, God. You do great things. And break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, you're awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. You have done great things. Oh God. indeed coming a day where we will sing this song again the song of a 
of a great God, but this time in glory at the feet of Jesus. Steve here, uh, our final sermon on being the bad guys, how to live for Jesus in a world that says you shouldn't. It's been a, a great uh, series for me, just having conversations with people at North Coast Church about what it means to live for Jesus in their setting. 
And today we're looking at uh, the last in that, uh, in the series. And uh, after that, we'll be going into Ephesians. But let's uh, look at the Bible together. We're going to do the Bible reading, and it's from 1 Corinthians. So if you've got a Bible with you, it's 1 Corinthians 1. We'll start at the first verse, but then we'll jump down to verse 18 after we've read the first three verses. So have a read of the Bible with me on this. 1 Corinthians 1. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Then through to verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord." How about we pray, and then we're going to look at uh, how those verses inform us about being the bad guys in the world that we're living in at the moment. So let's pray together. Father God, we pray that as we look at your word and as we look at the world we live in, that you will bring those two things together in such a way that we understand our world through your word and that we take our world to your word and we obey what you call us to do and that we live in the light of it and that we can go into this world joyously and live for Jesus in a world that says we shouldn't. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, there's a fantastic uh, novel uh, made into a TV series called The City and the City by an uh, equally fantastic named uh, bloke called China Melville. And in The City and the City, there are two cities uh, occupying uh, these areas. One's called Bezel and one's called Ulcoma. And this is a murder mystery between these two cities. Something's gone on that uh, an inspector called Inspector Borlu has to investigate this murder between these two cities. And one of the cities is, I guess if you thought about a 1950s Eastern European city, very run down, old cars, uh, smoky cafes, the houses are grimy, the buildings look shabby. That's one of the cities. That's uh, the city of Bezel. And another of the cities, uh, the other city, Ilkoma, is very Singapore. It's bright, it's shiny, there's uh, flashy cars, there's amazing uh, buildings. And uh, very, very different cities, very uh, different values. Uh, one of the cities has a very strong religious ancient framework, the other city is very secular. Uh, it's got all these differences between these two cities. And Inspector Bor Lu has to go between the two cities and navigate his way through these two very different places. Here's the kicker though. Uh, in the city in the city, both of those cities occupy the same geographical footprint. They are completely in the same territory. They are interwoven with each other. You drive your car down one side of the street and you're in the city of Bezel, but coming the other way is a car from the city of Ulcoma. And the government buildings of one city are near the government buildings of the other. But to be involved in either city, you need a passport to go from one city to the other. They even speak different languages. These cities occupy the same place, but they have completely different 
uh, frameworks of thinking. There are places in the cities called Crosshatch, and Crosshatch is where the lines are blurred. Which city is this? Is this Basel or is this Sulcoma? It's quite a great uh, image, isn't it? And you can imagine what it plays out on in a television series as well. And the, the point is that you've got to know which city you belong to. And if you belong to the other one, you're not really supposed to have much to do uh, with the other city. In fact, upon the penalty of imprisonment. I want to suggest that for those who belong to Jesus, that feels like our reality from day one, doesn't it? We live between two cities and there's a great tension there. It feels like we're living in that grey area in the two cities called Crosshatch. We don't quite know where we belong. Are we a citizen of Bezel? Are we a citizen of Ulcoma? And it feels like as Christians in this world, we have two identities. And what you do get when you come to the book of Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, Paul addresses that issue specifically. What does it mean like to live in a city called, I'll call it New Corinth, the people of God who live in Corinth, while you yet live in Old Corinth and what it looks like? And Paul starts with showing what it means to have two identities or an identity that lives here but belongs somewhere else. He starts the passage by saying, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those uh, sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. He talks about the church of God, a gathering in Corinth. It's God's people, God's city in Corinth. It's, if you like, new Corinth in old Corinth. And then he also identifies their identity and purpose. He said, call to be saints. You are people living in old Corinth who are called with meaning and purpose to be God's saints and part of another city. And what happens as you read through the book of 1 Corinthians is that this tension between God's people, the tension of living between two cities. It feels like you've got one geographical location you have to live in, but two completely different operating systems. I don't know about you, but as you go from church to work or university or school or whatever you're doing tomorrow, it feels like you're going from one operating system of how the world is formed and understood into a completely different one. So welcome to the life for the people of God living today. We have these weaving cities. Uh, we mingle with those whose views of history are completely different to ours. It diverges from us. We live alongside citizens shaped by cultural values that are completely alien and often hostile to our own. And we live among people who uh, perhaps we speak the same language, but we feel like those terms and those terminology, you know, t terminologies and understandings are completely different. The other thing I think we feel living in this tension of the city and the city is we feel a little bit insecure. We do feel like citizens of Basel in this setting. In this world in which says, get on the right side of history, people, you Christians, you're old hat. It feels like we're living in the old Eastern European city with our old ways and our old religion. And it just won't cut it in the world of Olcoma with its bright, shiny cars and fast-paced ways of doing things and its progressive view of history. Ulcoma has the confidence of being on the right side of history. And we sit in our drab corners in our smoky cafes uh, trying to unsee these enticements, so to speak. But it's even more confronting for us in this reality than it is in the novel or the series. We don't simply work in buildings next to Ulcoma's buildings. We don't simply walk past people who belong to another city. We share the same offices, we share the same boardrooms, and often we share the same houses as those who have completely different values to us. We don't go home to eat and play just with people from one city, but we intermingle, and that is a tension that we have to face. Now, how do we respond to those tensions of living as citizens of uh, the God's kingdom and God's city at the same time that we have to live here in Perth. And uh, people would say Perth is God's city, but uh, maybe not yet. <laughs> maybe not yet. There are historical responses to how Christians have dealt with the tensions of living in such a 
contrast of having to deal with the tension of living as God's people in places that don't recognize God. And I, I want to suggest uh, two of them is um, you get a flight mechanism in Christians and a fight mechanism. A flight mechanism and a fight mechanism. Now let me tell you about the flight mechanism. Christians historically in the past, if they felt under pressure from the place they're living in, have often formed monasteries or gated communities. And it's very easy, I think, to almost get ourselves into a little Christian bubble where we put up our barbed wire, if it's physical barbed wire or <laughs> it's just emotional barbed wire, and we create a parallel world. And we're waiting for the zombie apocalypse to arrive, and we've uh, stocked up on uh, beans, spam, and shotguns. And we're just waiting... Uh, Everyone's at a distance from us and we're keeping ourselves away. And we somehow think that if we don't interact at all with the city, then it will be okay. The problem of that, of course, is if you've seen the movie The Village, that sin comes from within us. It's not just out there. We have something about us that can ruin those, uh, those situations. Gated communities aren't exactly the way to go. So there's the flight mechanism that Christians take on. The other one's the fight mechanism. We're going to regain this culture and this city for Jesus and we're going to get all the political players on our side and we're going to lobby hard to make sure that we go back to what it was like in the 1950s, for example. Politics is our hope. Now, I am not against political involvement, uh, but I am against uh, storming <laughs> the Bastille, so to speak, or storming the capital. Is fight really what we want? And sometimes we take that to social media levels and we're just banging on angry about people all the time on social media. I don't think fight is the way that Christians should engage with this city, uh, not at least in those ways as, uh, uh, as we've been talking about. So we're left with a huge tension then. What do we do? And one of the things that people have done is to assimilate. Uh, what happens is we see Christians who walk away from the gospel. They go, you know what? The bright lights of Ulcoma are far more attractive to me. The things that I want to do in my life, Ulcoma will gratify and will give a, a tick of approval to. The church is just a little bit tight. And we see Christians walking away from grimy old Beazel into Ulcoma and they get embraced by this new city. And they're told, finally, you've come over to the right side of history. And we look at that and we, we kind of long to have the benefits of belonging to God's city without the increasing cost of the hostility where the other city looks at us and thinks that we shouldn't be living for Jesus the way we are. I don't think assimilation is the way to go. I think it's problematic. Now, is there a way forward for us? Is there a way forward as we read the paper every day and we see all these changes happening in our culture on sexuality and gender and how people can relate to the gospel? Is there a way forward? Well, as I said before, the 21st century did not catch God by surprise. And here in this letter of 1 Corinthians, uh, we, we see that Paul begins by mapping out the, the vast differences between the new Corinth people of God and the old Corinth city. And he talks about really two cities are really two ages. Central to the gospel's understanding of history is the conviction that the resurrection of Jesus uh, ushered in a new promised age. It replaced the present evil age. And the concept of these two ages is developed first in the Old Testament. The book of Isaiah finishes with the hope of a new heavens and a new earth. The present age was the age of brokenness, injustice, sin and death. And God's people are looking for a new age. And it says this in Isaiah 65. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. And the promise was that the new age would swallow up the old age. It's as if the city of God would swallow up the city opposed to God. And Jesus comes to Israel with this hope in mind that God would judge the wicked and vindicate the righteous, that God would provide a new creation in which his people would live in safety and holiness, and that God would pour out his Holy Spirit upon his creation. And it happened in Jesus. His cross, his resurrection, and the giving of the Holy Spirit was the completion of God's triple promise. The cross was the act of judgment. The resurrection was the first act of a new creation, and Pentecost was the arrival of God's Spirit poured out to renew his people. And we all go, yay, new age has come. Here's the point, though. The old age did not disappear. The new city arrives in the people of God, but the old city lives exactly next to it. 
The cross pays the price for sin and guarantees us a righteous verdict before God on the final day, yet sin still exists. Jesus' resurrection means that we won't die forever, but we will still die. The Spirit is given as a down payment of the future. The old age is hanging around like an unwelcome guest at a party. And the tension for the Corinthian Christians is, can we assimilate and sort of meld these two cities together and have a good time and not suffer for Jesus? Can we identify strongly as Christians, but at the same time identify very strongly as the old city of Corinth? And Paul is going to say, no, you need to act like the new city of God, even while you live in the old city, and it's going to create tension. And this is what Paul says to them. And he's reminding them of something. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And I want you to notice that term, this age. Where is the philosopher Where is of this age? What God is saying through uh, Paul there is that the old age has kind of been done away with because the message of the cross has come and swept it away. There's a new way of being and a new way of acting. However, the Corinthians had a problem. They kept looking over at Elkoma and all the bright, shiny stuff over there and the way that they did stuff and thought, can we have a little bit of that as well? And what impressed them uh, wasn't so much a great Netflix series about how you should live your life. It was fine, lofty speech. Philosophers who gave them a little tidbit of wisdom uh, for a bit of payment. It was the wisdom of the world. And Paul calls that the wisdom of this age. And he says, that is done. That is done. You have to know that you live between two ages or two cities. And he also says that old age's ways have been done away by the cross. And it sounds weak and it sounds stupid and it's true. <laughs> it does sound weak and stupid. But in the cross, Jesus has ushered in a new age. And now you are the church of God that is in Corinth and you are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. That's your identity. That's who you are. You are going to be citizens of a new Corinth, even while you live in the old Corinth. And Paul wants to remind them that no matter how bright and shiny Ulcoma, the bright, shiny city looks, it's a dead city walking. It's got no future. It's not where God is going. The problem is, you know, as Paul's highlighting this tension, if you live in Perth, you live in London, you live in Cape Town, you live wherever, or New York, how do you live between those two ages? How do you live as a citizen of this age, in this kind of city, while you belong to another city? And it's a deep problem. See, when Paul says, where is the philosopher of this age? Here's the problem. They might be at uni teaching your kids. <laughs> Where's the wise person? They're sitting on their balcony having coffee on a Sunday morning while you, the fool, are driving with five kids in the car screaming and shouting to church. It doesn't feel like, well, you're not this week, by the way, it doesn't feel very much like we're the future. It could be your boss saying, this is how we're going to roll things out as for our social policies over the coming two or three years. This is what Pride Week needs to look like on your floor. And you're going, how do I manage those things? Christianity looks like it's on the way out, and this age and its values looks like the future. And you're being told, get on the right side of history. That's what you're being told. The problem is, of course, we kind of want to lean away from the tension of it, don't we? That's the temptation, to lean away from the tension, to become more like old Corinth and become more accepted. So... Maybe we need to re-examine what the Bible says about Christian things about sexual ethics. Or maybe we need to reassess whether Jesus really is the only way to the Father. Or maybe we need to reconstruct uh, church life so that it better reflects the consumer values of our world. That's what we think. And Paul is saying, don't do that. Lean into it. Lean into it. I don't want you to think like that. 
I want you to think about a different way of living. I don't want you to think that somehow, you know, being relevant or impressive or being up with the cultural moment is going to last because it already belongs to the old age. We have to think about that ourselves. As we're in church, is it the size of our building? Is it the amount of people we've got? Is it the great programs that are going to change people's lives? No. Paul says it's going to be the gospel of Jesus proclaimed that's going to do it. And it looks stupid, but it works. It looks stupid, but it works. And Paul says to them, consider your calling. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak. I'll go back on that one, I think. I'll go forward a bit, I think. For God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Here's the thing about Paul. He just says, turn and look at yourselves. Look at what God has done through you. <laughs> look at who God has chosen to be his people. Foolish, weak, low, despised. He says, I want you to glory in that rather than press it down to impress the people over in that bright, shiny city over there. I'm going to upset the apple cart to show up the impressive. That's what God is doing in the cross. And that is what it means to follow Jesus as citizens of New Corinth, even while we live in Old Corinth or New Perth, while we live in in old Perth. The standards and the ways that we behave will be exactly the opposite. That's the task, to live that out. And it's an onerous task, isn't it? I think the task looks huge. The task looks huge every time you go into your office and it just feels like the pressure to work among people who just scorn God or even don't give them a thought. It's too high, especially when there's so much work to do. Here's the thing, though. The truth of what I have just said is good motivation enough to pursue a gospel-centered life. But not only is it true, it's good. There's something good about living like this in the way that the world does not recognize. This bright, shiny city over here, or coma, is a facade. It's a very elaborate, shiny facade, but it's a facade nonetheless. And a lot of work has to go into maintaining it. The sexual revolution in our culture has a high body count. If you think about the issues of how we're trying to impress people with who we are and our identity, many people are ending up uh, anxious and lonely and insecure because of it. And the church is liberated from all of that by Jesus. And we're going to look at it in Ephesians in a couple of weeks' time, where our identity is given to us by Jesus in such a way that we are liberated from performance and trying to look like that bright, shiny city. The differences between the old city and the new city are clear enough. We're called to live gospel ways. We're called to live forgiving, loving, serving, humble lives when those things don't look like they're going to get you anywhere. But the tension remains, doesn't it? The two cities still occupy the same footprint. How do we live as citizens of new Perth while we're in old Perth? How do we navigate the hostility that we're actually experiencing? So here's the point, isn't it? We've got to put our own city in order first. We've got to put our own city in order first. I think that's something that we need to think about. Read these verses that Paul writes later on in 1 Corinthians 5. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. What Paul is saying is, if you want to live as the city of God, you've got to start sorting yourselves out first. But also, you can't leave the world. You have to live there, but you're going to live there differently. And unless we're different, what's the point? There's no point wagging our finger at the old city if we're living exactly the same. So that's what we've got to get right. But Paul also gives them the freedom not to form a gated community and hide away. 
He said, you'd have to leave the world. And I don't want you to do that. You live here and now. You have to live among that different city. I'm not into flight or fight. You can't leave. So why does Paul have the confidence that you can do that? Surely it's because he knows that we have God's spirit within us. Now, if you were to take a submarine and go to the bottom of the ocean, you'd need to go to the bottom of the ocean. If you wanted to go down to the bottom of, and see what's down there, you'd need to get in something that would not crush you uh, by the weight of the water. Because as you go down in a submarine, the water pressure pushing on that submarine is massive. If you were to get out at the bottom of the ocean, you'd be completely crushed. But if you get into a submarine and you go down to the bottom of the ocean, you see all these tiny little fish swimming around. You think, how come they're not getting crushed? Here's how. They've been able to equalize the pressure. The pressure pushing out in those tiny little fish uh, negates the pressure pushing on them. It stops them from getting crushed. That's the role of the Holy Spirit as we live in that bright, shiny city that doesn't recognize God. The Holy Spirit in us equalizes the pressure, allowing us to live in this world without identifying with the world and living its values. It's huge. The next thing to realize is that we must accept that trouble may come. Even while we're living in this world, we must accept that trouble may come. Now, we've dealt with some of this before. And I think over the coming decades, we might find that some professional jobs are no longer open to Christians because they won't sign off on certain um, ethical perspectives. You might find that you lose friends. I know people that already have lost friends because they refuse to give in to the values of this world. And you may be scorned. We may even have to build alternate institutions for younger people to be able to <laughs> train and, and be educated. We must continue to do that. We will definitely have to double down on our discipleship. Never mind going to Babylon tomorrow morning. Our young people carry Babylon around in their pockets on a phone. <laughs> Babylon can get you in many ways. How can we get the Holy Spirit's work in our lives to be such that it equalizes the pressure and keeps Babylon at bay? And finally, some of us may actually be charged or prosecuted for what we believe and stand up for. We have to accept that trouble may come. So that's a big issue for us. Are we going to be disciples of Jesus that can accept that that could be our lot in life? I think the final thing to say is we need to look to the city that's coming. We need to look to the city that's coming. This old city, call it Bezel, call it Perth, call it whatever, this Christian version of it just doesn't look like it's that flash. But one day, God is going to sweep away the old and usher in a new creation where this will be glorified. Glorified. Look what it says in the book of Hebrews. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as in his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Unless you have the same hope as Abraham, you will look for all your hopes and dreams to be realized in the bright, shiny city. And you will not last. You will not last. And we have seen it with a steady conga line of ex-Christians, especially famous ex-Christians, who give up on the gospel. And they say, I do not want to identify with that city anymore. I like this. And when they go, they get showered with praise. But we are called by faith to live like strangers. We are called to remain citizens of Bezel in our identity, even while we have to live among Elkoma. But God promises there's a city coming. One day things will change. The new Corinth, the new New York, the new Jerusalem, the new Perth, call it what you will, one day God will bring us to that city. Or more to the point, God will bring that city to us. And on that day, the age of hostility and suspicion towards the people of God will give way to the age of eternal celebration. That's what we're hoping for. We are to look to the city that's coming as one of the things that will keep us strong 
in a world that says you shouldn't live for Jesus because one day all of the world will acknowledge that Jesus is king of this city. And that's the day we're looking forward to. Let's keep going. Let's keep living for Jesus in this hostile world. It's been a great series to unpack and unfold with you. And I pray that as we go into our week next week, whatever it looks like in the city uh, that we're going into, that we will live as those who are citizens of heaven most of all. Amen. Your name.